and uh, other advices from the Sheikh as this is the final uh, lecture for today for the Sheikh. Uh, but inshallah, as we know, the Sheikh is welcome to attend at any time you would like to. And this is his message, inshallah. Uh, so, barakallahu feek, Sheikh. Faddal mashkoor al Jura. Earlier today, during the morning time, we gave a presentation about the fiqh of Islamic Brotherhood. Uh, the vast majority of you were not present at that time. We had quite a few brothers here, but we wish that uh, all of you were here because Although we understand, we know, we embrace that we are brothers, a lot of times we don't know how to practice that, we don't know how to apply that. And as I told the brothers earlier today, what's going on in Palestine is a direct result of this Ummah not understanding the Islamic Brotherhood, what's going on in Al Iraq, in Syria, in Kashmir, in Burma, in Somalia, whether you put your finger on the map of Muslims in the world, put your finger on the map, you pick it up, it's going to be blood dripping from that place. That's a direct result of us not understanding the issue. So I really wanted to expose that talk to as many people as possible, but Allah is with you, decree that it was held in the morning and most of you didn't come. I'm not going to repeat that was over again those three sessions where we dealt with the arkan of the brotherhood and the darajat of the brotherhood and some, just some of the hukuk of the brotherhood. But I will take from what we started then and complete it with what I'm going to talk to you about today, inshallah. When we talked about the rights of brotherhood in al-Islam, we talked about that hadith in Sahih Muslim, Abu Hurairah, who said that the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Haqul Muslim ala al Muslim thalat or sitto. The rights that a Muslim has over his brother, or the rights that the Muslim lady has over her sister, all the same, is six. And he said, the first one is, when you see them, you should say, Salaamu Alaikum. The second one he said is when they invite you, you should answer the invitation to the walima, the aqiqa, or some munasaba party that they're having, lunch, dinner. The third one he said if they sneeze, and they say alhamdulillah, you have to say rahmakullah. And if they ask you for advice, then you have to give good advice. And if they become sick, you should visit them. And if they die, you should bury them and follow their janazah. You should do the kefin for them, shroud them, wash them, bury them, pray over them and follow their body. I want to just take one of those and then they want to deal with today. And that is the issue of al-nasiha. Al-nasiha in our religion is important. The Nabi of Islam sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made the whole religion of Islam al-nasiha. When he said al-deen with the al at tarif he didn't say dinun nasiha. He said a din, the religion, is a nasiha, the whole religion. And showing the importance of a nasiha, he used to, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, take the bayah from people. If you wanted to accept Islam, you come to him and you say, Ya Rasulullah, I want to accept Islam. Shadun la ilaha illallah, shadun Muhammad Rasulullah. And then he would take that bayah and take your hand and say, I give you this bayah that you give nasiha to every Muslim. Every Muslim. You give him advice. So we have this issue where we don't understand this brotherhood correctly. So as a result of that, there are a lot of things that are going on. Like this issue of the nasiha. He said about the Muslim, al-mu'min mir'atul mu'min. The believer is a mirror to his brother. 
So you may see in me things that I can't see. So you're like a mirror, and I'm a mirror for you. So you have to tell me, Abu, your kufi is to the side. Abu, you have something in your lehya. Abu, this or that. And you advise me, and I advise you. We don't do that. We'll have a person in our community who has an offensive odor. Maybe his breath, maybe his feet, or maybe his body just doesn't wash. For whatever reason, it can be his glands, it could be he's just not taking care of washing. And it's offensive. So when he comes in my presence and I smell him, instead of me saying to him in his face, hey, the Prophet says, Allah said to them, At-Tuhur, Shatur al-Iman. Cleanliness is half of faith. That's what the Prophet said, so I said that. And plus, Allah commanded us to give da'wah in Islam. Udu'u ila sabili rabbika. Give da'wah. Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas. All of those ayahs about giving da'wah. So when now Muslims see this person, smell this person, they're offended and they say this is Islam. So when I smell him, I don't have enough brotherhood, sincerity to tell him, hey man, you have to wash yourself. Hey sister, you have to be like this, you have to be like that. So we don't want to be with those people. We want to give you advice today. Now I could talk about this lecture that they wanted me to talk about. Just like they asked me to talk today early about al Qawaid al Arba. That's an important book. It's one of the beginning books that we should talk about and teach people. But I think learning about how to be brothers is more beneficial than that book. So I told them I'm not doing al Qawaid al Arba. It's important. But teaching this community, you young people, brothers and sisters, all of us, how to be a brother to your Muslim brother, how to be a sister to your Muslim sister, that's more important. It's more informative, more inspirational, and it's more needed and more practical. I teach you Kuwait and Arba, and you're sitting there, and some of it doesn't even apply, really. Whereas, how to be a brother to someone is a problem. Because we're trying to move all of our communities forward. This community, this message right now, we have to move it forward into the future. Inshallah. And if we don't understand brotherhood, we're not going to do it. Or it's going to be difficult, and we'll waste a lot of unnecessary time, effort, and energy. So in keeping with that hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I want, to invite, I want to advise you guys, you brothers and sisters, about something that I believe is really critical at this juncture in our development, you young people. I want this thing to be in your head. And what we're going to do in this session, inshallah, is we're going to talk about the importance of al-haya in al-Islam. I'm just going to touch the surface again, inshallah, al-haya. I'm going to say the word, and I want you to say the word. al hayau Now, I told the people earlier, we got to be together. We have to be united. We have to be together. Not like Sufi Dekker, but we have to be together, like one community. al hayau al hayau All right. al hayau How many of you heard of the word al hayau Not al hayatu dunya hayatu dunya Not that. al hayau not al hayatu with a ta marbuta. Al hayau. How many of you heard of that word before? How many of you didn't hear of the word? Put your hands up. Some of you didn't put your hands up for either one. Which one was it? How many of you heard the word before? Put your hand up. Al hayatu. All right. How many of you never heard the word before? Okay. Al hayatu. Al hayatu. It means shyness. To be shy. To be modern. To be to be modest. Something that I have to teach all of my kids. And it's one of those words that we as people, we're not Arabs, it's not our language, we are Ajim. This is one of those words that should be in your Islamic vocabulary. Al Hayatu. Al Hayatu is this thing about being shy and about being and about being embarrassed at certain things when you behave the wrong way. And it's the most important, the single most important akhlaq in al-Islam. You know that the Prophet came to correct the people's akhlaq. As he says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, bu'idtu li utammam makaram al-akhlaq. I've been sent 
to perfect people's al-akhla. So from good character is being truthful. From good character is being brave. From good character is being honest, being patient. From good character is being articulate. Don't think being able to speak and expressing yourself intelligently is corny. Now obviously if you're hanging out with people who you hang out with and you just kicking it with him, no problem. But the Nabi of Islam, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was an articulate person. And a lot of times the education that we have, the education that people of color have, is that our education is not that good. So we may not speak English in a correct way. And we're embarrassed to speak English correctly. No, nope. from good akhlaq is for a person to speak well. So there are a lot of things from good akhlaq. Being clean, being a person who you are forbearing. So many issues. But out of all of the khuluq in al-Islam, the most important one is al-hayat. The Prophet says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the kulli ummatan khuluqa, wa khuluq al-Islam al hayat Every community, every ummah before us, they had a, character, a characteristic trait that identified them. That was the most important. He said the character of al-Islam is al-hayahu. As for the importance of al-hayahu, fahaddin wa la haraj. Too many things. One time, there was a companion who was talking to another man who used to be shy and embarrassed. He used to be shy and modest. And that companion, he was like strong and he would say, don't be like that, don't be like that. Being tough with him, to tell him to walk strong, you know, walk like a man with some swag and don't be like that. When the prophet heard him doing that to him, he said, Da'u, leave him. فَإِنَّ الْحَيَاءَ لَا يَأْتِي إِلَّا بِخَيْءٍ Leave him. Because al-hayat, being modest, being shy, it only brings good. Being modest and being shy doesn't bring any evil. It only brings good. All good comes from you being modest and you being shy. Also it shows its importance, many things. He said in the hadith, two of them are very similar to each other, but they're saying different things. One hadith said, al hayau khayrun kulluhu. al hayat shyness is all of good. All of what's good comes from al hayat All of it. And similar to he said, al hayau kulluhu khayr. He said, everything about al hayat is good. And that goes to show the importance of learning the Arabic language. Because those of you who are studying Arabic learning, you start learning about the mubtada and the khabar and what's going on in the sentence, it helps you to understand what the speaker is saying. What did Allah want in this verse? What did the Prophet want in that hadith? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when he said that, al hayau khayru kulluhu and al hayau kulluhu khayr is very close, but they mean different things. All of it goes to show the importance of al hayat. All of it. And a lot more can be mentioned. Ma utila al hayau fi shayin illa zano. He said, modesty, shyness was never put inside of something except that it beautified that thing. So if you put modesty inside of your heart, it's going to beautify you. Inside of your home, inside of the masjid, it's going to beautify you. So those are some hadith that tell us the importance of al hayau. Also, from the virtues of al hayau, a meaning. And that is, you can't be a real Muslim without al haya. If you're one of those Muslims and you don't have al haya, I'm on the bus in Birmingham last Thursday. Some youngsters got on the bus. Somali girls. They are origin Somali, British, but they are Somali. And they went in the back. And the three of them made it their business to be the loudest people on the bus. They wanted people knowing who they were and they listened to them. And they had hijab on, black hijab. It wasn't like they 
were showing their hair and all of that. They had makeup on and things like that. Very loud. And one of these Afro-Caribbean Jamaican guys started giving them dawa about Islam and this, and they didn't know anything about Islam, but the point was they were very loud. It was very inappropriate. And they're the type of people who I know from experience and from wisdom don't say anything to them because if you try to say something to these girls the way they are, it's going to escalate. It's going to escalate. They're going to be disrespectful to you. So just leave them. That's the less of the two evils. So my point is, if the girl had hayat, shyness, modesty, she wouldn't behave like that. She doesn't want people to see and hear her. When Ali ibn Abi Talib asked his wife, Fatima, and both of them grew up in the house of prophecy, Ya Fatima, what is the most beloved thing to the Muslim lady? She said, for that lady, Muslim lady, not to see men who are not her mahari, and for them not to see her. She wants to be quiet, out of the picture. al hayat The Prophet told the men, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, about as zawaj He said about the men that the married lady who was divorced or she'd been married before, you have to get her permission. You can't just marry her off to anybody. You gotta get her permission. And he said, what bigger and bigger to step than what Ibn to her. Now, the virgin girl, he said, you have to ask her, do you want to get married? But because she's so shy from Al Hayat, her mother and her father come to her father and say, hey, so and so came to me, wants to marry you. His son wants to marry you. You want to get married? She's so shy, she just put her head down. She can't even say yes. So if you're one of those people where your father comes to you and says, hey, so and so wants to marry you, and you say to your father in front of the people, blah, 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 blah. There ain't hey, something wrong with that picture. Because that virgin girl is not supposed to be like that. She has that. But in this society right here, this society teaches her, lose your hayat. Talk, do what you want to do, be how you want to be. It's okay. In this masjid right now, and we're in this part of the masjid, from the end of the masjid is, we should respect the joke, the atmosphere, and even more, your woman, your woman, even more, you have to be careful about being heard and being seen. So my point here is that al hayau is from Al-Iman. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ala Ali Wa Sallam, Al-Hayau Wa Al-Iman Qurina. Ida rufya ahaduhuma rufya al-akhir. Al-Hayat and Iman have been put together in Al-Islam. If one of them is taken away, the other one is going to go as well. So you can't be a mu'min without al-hayat. They are together. He said, al-iman, bid'un wa sab'un shu'ba, alaha qawlu la ilaha illallah wa adnaha imatat al-aban al-tariq, wal-hayat shu'batun min al-iman. Faith and iman is 70 something degrees. The highest level of faith is when you say, La ilaha illallah, nothing comes higher than that. And the lowest level of al-iman is picking up something harmful that's in the street, in the way, it's harmful. And he said between that, al-hayat is a branch of faith. Now listen to this and pay attention to this. The highest level of iman, kalimat al-tawheed, the qawl of thad, that's the highest. The lowest level, taking something harmful off the street. There are many things in between there. لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لي أخي ما يحب لي نفسي. None of you truly believes. None of you has true iman. Do you love for yourself, your brother? What you love for you? That's in between there. To love for your brother, what you love for yourself. As we talked about brotherhood earlier. So between that, Allah Allah takes up. But why did the Prophet, out of all of the other things, he mentioned al hayat he didn't mention loving your brother and all of those other things that are a part of al-hayat. Goes to show the importance of al-hayat. It's part of al-iman. Not just al-iman with us, but al-iman with the people who went before us. As al-imam and know we brought in the 40 hadith that I know all of you are aware of, al-imam and know we and I encourage you people 
to read, learn, memorize those ahadith from 40 hadith of Al Imam Al Nawi. Some of the books that we're going to teach the people here today, like the Lamia, Abu Abbas is going to teach that book. It's important. That one wants to teach Al Nuniya, and that one Al Wasatiya. Oh, that's beautiful. But before all of those books, you guys, all of you, we need to read that book, 40 Hadith of Al-Imam and know And memorize as much as you can and understand those Ahadith. Because those Ahadith are from the most important Ahadith in Al-Islam. Anyway, one of those Hadith from his Jawami' al kalam is the Hadith of Abu Mas'ud al-Badri. May Allah be pleased with me. Said the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Inna mimma adrak al-nas min kalam al-nabuwat al from what all of the prophets told their people. Every prophet came and he told his people. He said to them, if you feel no shyness, then do as you like. And that hadith has two meanings. Meaning, you want to do something. I'm thirsty right now. I want to drink this water. But I don't know whose water it is. Does it belong to someone? Maybe it's Zamzam water and it belongs to someone. But I'm looking and I said, I don't think someone will eat Zamzam water here. This cup is half empty. I think someone poured it here. There's no one here. And we have so much other water, so I'm not shy. I'm just going to drink it. And it means it's okay. Because I wasn't shy to do it. And the reason why I wasn't shy to do it is because it's not unique. There's all this water around here. So I don't feel any shyness, so I'm going to do it. It means it's okay because I'm not shy to do it. But if you're shy to do it, then don't do it, because it means it's wrong, like right now. Someone may not like me as a person. Someone may not like what I'm saying. But no one in this audience is going to stand up right now in front of everybody and say, hey, shut up, because he has hayat. Because when he stands up and say, hey, shut up, we ain't trying to hear that, everybody's going to look at him and remember, this is the guy who stood up in the masjid and he was Khalil and Adam. His hayat stopped him from behaving like that. When you don't have al hayat, when you don't have al hayat, it's okay. Now, the other meaning of the hadith is if a person's hayat has been taken away, he's going to do whatever he wants to do. Like some of these women who walk around with no clothes on, they do that not necessarily because they're bad people. I know some good people from my relatives who are decent girls, decent women, but they dress in a provocative way because the hayat has been killed in them. So they don't know walking around with tight jeans, showing themselves like that, is inappropriate. So you do what you want to do. Guys who walk around with their pants down their backside, and most of their backside is showing. Why? He doesn't have any hayat. It's been taken away from him. That's why he's walking like that. And he actually thinks it's acceptable and it's cool. But the reason why he thinks that is, he's mixed up. He doesn't have hayat. If he had any hayat, he knows when you come out in public, you have to present yourself in the best way possible. You can't come out looking like a bum. I have children. If my son ran in this door and he came up to give me some love, and he had, you know, feel, feel, you know, feel, his hair was all crazy. My wife didn't brush his hair and comb his hair. I'm saying, what, 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 what are you doing with my son? When my kids go out of that house, they're a reflection of you and me, of the Thehebi tribe, our crew. So when they come out, let them look, not necessarily like you look on the day of the age, but presentable. But if you don't have a hayat, you'll come out of the house anyway. You don't care. So all of that goes to show that all of the prophets and all of the messages, they used to give da'wah to al hayat. Now, what am I getting at? I'm getting at you young people in this message, not just you young people, but all of us. We have to have some hayat. And hayat in the way you behave, and hayat in the way you talk, and hayat in the way people perceive you. It is embarrassing for the Muslim father or mother to have to go down to the police station and get a kid out of the police station and the community hears about what happened. So-and-so's son stabbed someone and killed him. 
Over what? Nothing. That happens because qillatul hayat. Someone gets drunk, drinks khamar, vodka, whatever he drinks, and he's walking down the street babbling like a fool. This is how he talks. Blah, 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 blah. Because he's drunk. And he's vomiting, spitting up because he's drunk. And he may even urinate on himself because he's drunk. The way kids act. Not this kid. You know, our little, little toddlers. Two years old, one years old. The kid is going to vomit on himself. The kid can't talk. You know, even us, when we talk to the little kid, we say, oh, boo-boo is okay. What Mookie doing? Boo, boo, boo. And the, and the kid is talking back to you like that. God, God, boo, boo. And that's how the adult is when he drinks Hummer. Or that person, for an example, and I've seen this. I've seen this in Liverpool where I live right now. That guy had, this is small. He had about three, four times this side of cock in his mouth. It was like this. And he had no hayat that you're out in public and look at your face, it's like this. And you're in front of people talking, partying, this. And hayat, having hayat, it stops people from doing those things that are not correct. Now I want to just deal with some things about some shubahat that people have about al hayat. This is important. Some of us think that al hayat is only for the girl. But it's not for our boys. So if the Muslim girl has a boyfriend, we become very upset as a father, as an uncle. We don't like it. And rightly so. But if the boy has a girlfriend and he's doing the same thing, we're not that upset. Some people may even encourage him and say, that's my boy. Way to go. And both of them are bad. The boy is bad and the girl is bad. And that double standard here is not acceptable. It is the social hypocrisy that we need to deal with. Prophet Muhammad didn't have that social hypocrisy. When he used to come, none of the companions would stand up for him, to honor and respect him. Ibn Abbas said, because we knew he hated that. No one, we loved him more than everybody, but when he came, we didn't stand up for him. We stayed sitting down. So what we have today is the companions didn't stand up because someone came in. They said, set him down. That's the etiquette of Islam. But the etiquette of Europeans and white people, this part of their society is if you want to show someone respect, you get up. So when someone comes into our masjid, he has some position, we'll stand up for him. <coughs> but when some insignificant person comes in, the same masjid, nobody stands up for him. That's social hypocrisy. We should either stand up for everybody or sit down for everybody. As for standing up for this one and sitting down for the other ones, it's not right. When we want to do the Salat of Janazah for the Ghadi, someone dies and he was important. He was the first Mu'adhan in this masjid. So he traveled back to his country and he died. They're going to make Salat of Janazah on him so we don't make it here now. Why are we going to make it? We make Salat al Janazah the Ra'ib for the one who the Salat wasn't prayed on, like it happened with the Najashi, radiallahu anhu. But someone who the people pray on, don't pray over him again. Unless there's a religious reason, like the Prophet did with the black lady who used to sweep the masjid. I told you about her today. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anyway, my point is social hypocrisy. What about that guy who. Like in our masjid where I'm at, we have a lot of Arabs. If someone dies in their country, they always used to want to do Salat al-Janazah right. But when someone comes from West Africa and he says, my uncle died back in Cameroon. He built six masjids. He had a big madrasa. They don't want to stand. They don't want to give a Salat al ghai for him. If we give it for one person, we have to give it for everybody. In this masjid, for an example, the vast majority of people are from Somalia. But this is not a Somali masjid, but they're from Somali. So someone big time dies in Somalia, someone, okay, we do Salat al -Ghai. Okay, no problem if you choose to do that. The one who comes from this community says, my uncle in Nigeria died, my uncle in Cameroon died, my uncle in Chad died. And I say we should close that door altogether because every day we'll be doing Salat al for the Ghai, every day. So my point is, 
We don't have social hypocrisy in Islam. The hadith said, al Muslimun The Muslims, their blood is equal. Everybody's blood here is equal. There's nobody here. His blood is more important than the next man. Everybody's not on the same level, obviously. The Hufad of the Quran, they have a special position. The Shayukh who are big and older, they have a special position. Your mother, if she's here, she got a special Everybody is different. But in terms of our blood, our blood is equal. Nobody's blood is more important than anyone. Meaning, meaning what? If you can imagine, Ya Abdullah, this is a ship and we're all traveling on the ship. All of us. Everybody in this room. Men, women, youngsters, elders, all of us. And the ship gets a hole in it and it starts to sink. We say, hey, we gotta lighten the load. We gotta start throwing stuff off the ship. So we throw all of our luggage off. But the ship is still sinking. Nothing is left except us. So we all look around and we say, we gotta decide. Some of y'all gotta go overboard. So someone says, okay, the elders, they're close to death already. Let's throw them overboard. Some of the elders are going to say, nah, 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 y'all ain't throwing us overboard. Hold on, hold on. What about the little kids? They innocent. They don't have any sins. Let's throw them jokers overboard. They go straight to Jannah. The mothers and the fathers of those kids are going to say, man, y'all ain't throwing my kids overboard. You ain't throwing. Everybody has a reason why someone else can go and someone else shouldn't go. We say, okay, we're men. Let's throw the women overboard because we're strong and we'll continue to spread our species. But women say, no, 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 Prophet Muhammad, he had rahmah for women and children. You men jump overboard and try to swim and get back. You know what the answer is? The answer is nobody gets thrown overboard. None of us. And that's because all of our blood is equal. And nobody's blood is more important or less important in the law than anyone. Not only is our blood equal, but, but for someone to kill you and to spill your blood, if the Kaaba was destroyed, the Kaaba, that's Ahmud wa Allah, that is lesser in degree than for one Muslim to be killed. Someone kills a Muslim unjustly. Prophet Muhammad said, for the Kaaba to be destroyed, broken up and torn down, that's a big thing, but it's lesser with Allah than one Muslim to get killed unjustly. So what do you think about a person who his religion is, he believes he can put a bomb in this room and blow everybody up? 300, 400 people. What's wrong with people? And then we wanna jump up and down and get upset at what Trump said about Palestine, Jerusalem, being the capital of Israel. We jump up and down. Jumping up and down for what? We have people from our ummah who will kill this whole room, everybody in this room, just to get one minister that he doesn't like. And in his mind, it's justified. All of these innocent lives. He doesn't think, Yom Al-Qiyam, when I stand up for Allah, I have to answer to all of this. And people call that Islam. And they want Islam. And they want the freedom of our country. But lie, I'm going to tell you people, listen to what I'm telling you right now. There was a man from the companions who was making jihad, beating up the kuffar. He was killing them, doing real well. Then they took a break from the war and everybody relaxed. The companions came and said, Ya Rasulullah, if you would have saw that man, that man was really doing, he was amazing. Prophet Muhammad said, he's from the people of the hellfire. Not a single companion said, what? How? But they didn't make ihtirab. Because when they heard him say something, they knew it was the truth. Whereas today, you say the prophet said this, Allah said that. And the people of today say, come on, man, come on, man. That's why we have Palestine the way it is. That's why Iraq and Syria, Kashmir. That's why we got all this drama. We bring this to some, Allah said, Prophet Muhammad said, and the Muslim today say, oh, come on, man, but you know, come on, come on. So anyway, you said that man from the hellfire. When they re-engage and started fighting the non-Muslims, someone stabbed that man. One of the kufar stabbed him. So while he was there, he was in pain, couldn't be patient just to die. He took his 
sword, put it in the ground, and threw himself on the sword, committed suicide. When the companions saw that, they went back and said, yes, sir, so what? That man killed himself, committed, he committed suicide. And if you commit suicide, you go to hellfire, and you punish yourself the way you committed suicide. And then he said, and this is the point, in Allah, لَيَنْسُوا هَذَا الدِّينِ بِرَجُلٍ فَاجِرٍ it may be that Allah will help this religion with a bad person. Allah can help this religion with a person who's a bad person. He can. So what's my point? It has happened in the past where the Aqidah of the Mu'tazila, the Aqidah of the Ashairah, it's not correct Aqidah, but they gave this Ummah some good. Asul al-Fiqh came from some of the people of Ahl Karam. And Asul al-Fiqh is a very important principle to help us in our religion, to understand it. And some of those people were upon that stuff. Some of them. I'm sure you heard of Salahuddin al-Ayyubi. He liberated Palestine from the hands of the enemies of Islam. And he was a man who spread the aqidah of the Asha'irah. What's my point? I want you to remember this. There are two groups of people from this ummah who never ever helped this ummah in history. Never ever. You can't give me an example of history like Salahuddin helped the religion. This Murtazi, this Ash'ari, they helped the religion here and there. But these two groups never helped the religion. One, the Khawarij. The Khawarij never helped this religion. Whether they're Boko Haram, Qaeda, Shabab, whoever they are. These people want to blow people up. Don't get me wrong now. We have to have Wallah wa Barak. We don't want people coming to our countries, taking our land and disrupting our lands and killing our people. We have to defend ourselves. But we have a religion that shows us how to do and how not to do. As for blowing up our people and killing us, it's the Muslims who suffer from the hands of the Khawarij more than the non-Muslims. The Khawarij never ever helped this religion. Never. Not once. A thousand pounds to anybody here who can bring me an example and say, hey, this was a dola of the Khawarij and they used to help Islam. Never. They hurt us. More than they hurt the Kuffar. So never be on the defensive when the non-Muslims are talking about Al-Qaeda and Boko Haram and these people. Your religion is terrorism. You say, hey, hey, we get hurt by those people far more than you. That's the first group. Second group, <coughs> the Rawafi. The Rafida, people who curse Abu Bakr and Uthman and, and those companions. So the fact that they gave this ummah the mole, they would never give this ummah anything that's beneficial. You remember that point. You remember that. That's not to say the Asha'ir and the Mu'tazir are okay. I'm just making a point that you got some good from them, some benefit. An Imam and Imam at Dhabi in his book, Sir Alam al Nubala. He brings different ulama from their group, and he praises them for what they did, but not the Khawarij and not the Rawafi. They bring no good. As it relates to this issue of Hayat, social hypocrisy. Listen, and Hayat is just as much for the boy as it is for the girl. But it should be in the girl more. It should be in the girl more. But it doesn't mean that the boy doesn't have al haya. They describe the Prophet وسلم, and the Prophet said about him, Kana and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ashadda Haya and Men al Idra'i Bihtadriha. The Prophet had more shyness than a virgin girl in the inner recesses of her home. So there's a girl who, when women company come to the house, her mother's friends, they come to the house. She doesn't sit with them. She goes in the back because she's so shy to sit with them. She doesn't really want to have kalam with people. When you're going to get married, what's going on? She just want to be by herself. They said Prophet Muhammad was more shy than that. They said when we used to see him, we knew he was angry about things because his face would change. He was shy. So that goes to show if he was shy, it's not a characteristic just for women, just for the girls. It's a characteristic for everybody, but it's more so for the woman. If she doesn't have hayat, 
And she's not the girl you want to marry. And if he doesn't have al hayat, you have to think, he's not the guy you want to marry. But when you're looking for a wife to marry, when you're looking for something, you want to see, does she have hayat? When we all go to the restaurant or something like that, and the people come to take our order. People come to take our order. He said, okay, what are you guys having? She's the first one, yeah, give us a mixed dish. This is what we wanted. Hey, 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 fall back and relax, you. You fall back and relax. You got brothers here, you got your, your wife, your husband is here, your father is here. Does that mean she's a second class citizen? She can't speak on her own, she doesn't have feelings? No, doesn't mean that. It just means the woman is an aura. She shouldn't be seen or heard unless, unless it's absolutely necessary. So most of us don't use our house phones. We don't even use that anymore. But you gotta get one because it's just like that. You got to get a house phone, but we barely use it. So when someone calls that house phone, the rule should be, if you got boys in that house, don't let your daughter pick up the phone. Unless someone who's calling down the line has bad akhlaq. He doesn't have hayat. She picks up the phone, it's a problem. She got brothers there, her father's there, her husband's there. Now if nobody's there, she answers the phone. So the misconception of Hwani is, hayat is for everybody, but it's especially for the girl. How do we know that? Because the Prophet mentioned it too many times in too many incidents. Let me just give you one in the Quran. When Musa left Fir'aun after killing that man, and then he was getting ready to fight another man, and the man said, You want to kill me like you killed the guy yesterday? Musa realized they were onto him. Another man came and said, Hey, Fir'aun and his people, they're conspiring, making the Mu'amr. They look, they know your situation. They know they're going to get you. So Musa left Egypt. He escaped with his life. As he was wandering aimlessly, he made a dua and asked Allah, you don't guide me. I'm, I'm in need of your guidance. Musa in the Quran came upon a group of people who were watering their animals. But he saw two women who were far apart. They were not watering their animals with these people. Musa went to them and said, what, what, what's your situation? Why, why are you standing away? You're not Water. They said, we don't want to mix with the men. We don't want to mix with the men. <coughs> Fama al-haya is for the girl not to have a job where she's just rubbing shoulders and hanging out with men. Now, if she has to have that job, because I'm, I'm all about the reality on the ground, you may have to work. There are men around. Well, al-haya means you don't have that easy clam with those people in that office where you're working. You know how people be talking to each other. You, you don't do that. So those two women, although they were not even from Al-Islam as we know it, they were believing women. They didn't mix with those men. Musa said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll water your, your animals. Musa took those animals. He watered the animals, took them back to the girls. The girls left. They took the animals to their father. Some of the people of the Quran said that that man, his name is Jethro of the Bible. That story is in the Bible. Saleh, Jethro. Allah alam is Saleh, Jethro of the Bible. But it seems like he is. The same story, this exact story is in the Bible. Look what happened when Allah mentioned this is the point. Allah Ta'ala said, فَجَاءَتُ إِحْدَاهُمَا تَمْشِي عَلَى سْدِحْيَاءٍ Allah said, one of the girls came back to Musa and she was walking with hayat. She was walking with shyness. She came to Musa and said, my father is calling you. My father wants you to come. He wants to pay you and reward you for causing our animals. You, you watered our animals. So lies were just described her walking, that she walked in that way. The fact that the Prophet them said the virgin girl, her silence is her approval. The fact that they compared him to the virgin girl in this shyness, then you come to understand that shyness is an integral characteristic for the Muslim woman. And I'm here to say to my Muslim sisters back there, you young girl, my nieces, my nieces, you have to see yourself as being queen material, not in an arrogant way, 
but just the way Islam has honored you and how it has raised you up. But if you allow yourself to be European in the way you think women are and how they have to be, you reduce that level and people will deal with you appropriately and accordingly. So you guys have to have some hayat by wearing hijab, the way you carry yourselves, the way you behave, make every man know. If you want access to me, you have to come through the front door. Gotta let my father know. His companion, his name is al burad ibn Azib. May Allah be pleased with him. Tremendous companion. He said, Nahana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam illa takallam al-nisa illa bi-idni awliya'ihinna The Prophet made it haram for us men to talk to girls except by the permission of their wali. Can't just be kicking it with some sister on the internet or talk to a girl her father doesn't know. You have to have hayat. And the girl especially has to have hayat. You can't let him have that kind of access because if you do, you're telling him what kind of girl you are. You're telling him what kind of girl you are. You're one of those people who your, your standards are very low. You just want attention and that's enough for you. Just get the right attention. So what I wanted to share with you brothers and you sisters here today, inshallah, concerning the issue of al-hayat, is not just something out of a vacuum, just haya hayat, no. We have to be better. So, as it relates to what hayat, what is not hayat? There are some things we think is hayat, but it's not hayat. Hayat only bring good. Some people think that they're afraid to advise people, and they think that's hayat, but that's not hayat. That's being a coward. If you see something that someone is doing and you know that it's wrong, you have a religious responsibility to give an advice. And you can't say, I'm shy. Even if your uncle, your mother, your father, your brother, even if it's the speaker, the sheikh. The sheikh is tired, he's sitting there and he yawns. And he's tired. And he yawns and he goes, Ugh. He didn't mean that. It's a slip. You saw it. You can't sit there and say, the sheikh must know, I think the sheikh knows, he just forgot. No. It's your job in a nice way. At some point to say, sheikh, we saw you yawn like that. God put the Prophet Muhammad said, put the thing over your mouth. The Prophet told this community, لا يمنع أن أحدكم هيبة الناس أن يقول بحق إذا شهده أو سمع به أو علمه. Don't let fear of people stop you from saying the truth if you witness the truth. If you knew the truth, you saw the truth, someone comes and says, I need you to be a witness against so-and-so. He's like, I'm shy, I'm not getting involved because, you know, he's an older person or he's my uncle. No, nope. you can't be shy in this. The guy has his ring on his finger. Look, 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 look. This finger right here. Prophet Muhammad prohibited men from wearing the ring on this finger. You can wear the ring on this finger or this finger and that's it. Women can wear the ring on this finger, this finger, and this finger. Men, only these two fingers. A religion that came and told us what finger the ring is worn on. A religion that came and told us how to go in the bathroom and out of the bathroom. A, ring, a religion that told us how to relieve ourselves when we go into the bathroom, what to say, what to do. But it forgot to tell us about the prophet's birth. You no, know, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Anyway. You see that the person has the ring on this finger, and you know it's not. You don't leave him with the ring on the finger. You tell him at some point, listen, I heard a hadith, I read a hadith, it's probably <coughs> to have a ring on this finger. You don't just leave the guy in doing that thing in which he's doing, drinking with his left hand, eating with his left hand, whatever the issue is. Everybody here, there are people around us who are not doing the right thing. And it's because sometimes people don't know. She doesn't have the correct hijab on. Not because she's a bad girl. She just started practicing. She's a brand spanking new Muslim. And you look at her and you just, what? What are you going to say? You're just going to take it for granted? Why leave her? You can't have al-hayat and issues like that. Lastly, lastly, when it comes to learning, you can't have an hayat. Two people will never learn. 
The one who is arrogant and he thinks he knows everything, he will never learn because he thinks he knows everything. And the second person is the one who is too shy. He's shy to ask questions. There was a lady who came to the Prophet and her face was uncovered. A delay, you don't have to wear niqab. She came into the medjits, her face was uncovered. Before answering, asking a question, she put the veil over her face. She said, Ya Rasulullah, inna Allah la yastahi min al haq Allah is not shy of the truth. al maratu hal tahtadam? The Muslim woman, does she have a nocturnal dream? Does she have a wet dream at night? She sees in her dream. I'm not going to get too deep into that. You explain to your family what that means, but I hope you understand. Does what happens to a man when he sees in his dream, when he goes to sleep, something happens. We have to wake up and make a ghusl. Does a woman have that same thing? She couldn't ask that question out in public. She was shy because the men were there. As if she was hiding herself. And they saw her face, but she didn't want to say that out loud. But the point is, her shyness didn't prevent her from learning her religion. So we have some of these things that are going on. You're growing, you're growing up, you're growing up. You have these things that are going on as you grow up. And when it happens, you have to ask people. You may be shy to ask your father, your mother, not your older brother, ask your older sister. Just don't learn that stuff from the street. Don't do that. Ali ibn Abi Talib, when he came from Mecca and he went to Medina, it was cold, and it gets cold in Medina. Not like outside, but it's cold. So anytime he used to use the toilet, akramakum Allah, something would come out of him from his prostrate gland. It's called mevi. Not semen, it's mevi. It's transparent. It used to come out of him. He needed to know what is the ruling of this stuff. Now if you're in, you know that's nijasa. And you have to make wudu from that. The other thing, you know that that's not nijasa, but you gotta clean and gotta make wudu. What is the ruling of this? He couldn't go and ask his wife's father that question. That's his wife's father. He's going to ask the father of the wife something connected to the private. He couldn't. He's haya. Haya. Look at us today. The person is in his house watching TV. The co comedian is swearing and cursing and saying crazy stuff. The movie is showing kissing and this and that. And the warrior comes in, and we don't turn it off, we don't move. She may even sit down and watch it with you. That's the European way. That's the European way. And this is what's happening to us today. So this little guy right here, this little guy, I'm telling you guys, mark my words, five years from now, inshallah, ten years from now, Islam is going to be different in this country. Islam is going to be different. If we don't get a grip and do something about addressing these challenges. Anyway, anyway, point is, Ali ibn Abi Talib told his friend, you go to the Prophet وسلم, and tell the Prophet that this thing is happening. What should you do? The man when they say, Ya Rasulullah, this thing comes out, uh, what, what should I do? He says, why should I make wudu? You don't have to make wudu, why should I make wudu? Now, if the man was shy, he just left him like that. He just left himself like that. He'll be making salat, and he didn't do the right thing because he was shy. And you as a father, I as a father, we got to get on top of this stuff. As soon as your son starts to get pubic hairs, you got to sit down and talk to him straight up. Can't be talking to him like this, like some of the culture. Father takes the razor. You know the razor. He takes the razor, he gives it to his son, and then he bounced. He just leave. The son got the razor and he's looking at the razor and he's wondering, well, well, what did he give me this for? Because the father didn't say anything to him. He just gave him a razor. The son picked up the razor and he says, well, what, what did he give this for? You want me to go in business and sell razors as well? And he's having to figure it out. You know, you got to sit there and tell your son, hey boy, the time has come now for you to keep your grooming kept up and for you to do that. Don't let your kids learn this khurafat out in the street. Don't let them learn from their, from their friends. They have to have that relationship with their father where they can come and talk. I couldn't do that with my father. I couldn't do that with my father. It was uncomfortable and the way he was. But in the deen of Allah, in this deen, it's a new picture. It's a new story.
So I'm gonna stop right now, inshallah ta'ala, because someone else is scheduled to come now. I mean, I see you guys again, you young people, again. You guys are the future of Islam in this country, inshallah. All we want from you is a few things. We want you to stay balanced in your religion and in your lives. Don't eat too much, don't sleep too much, don't talk too much, don't work too much, don't worship too much, be balanced. We also want you to follow the way of the companions. That's the only religion that Allah is going to accept from us, Yom al You ain't gonna accept anything else. Stay away from all of these groups and just stick with, did the companions do that? This worship, did they do it? This aqidah, did they believe in it? This, this, this celebration, did they do that? If you don't find them doing it, it's not from our religion. So don't do it. And lastly, here in this community, here, I would assume most of you are from Coventry. This masjid has been growing and developing for years. It's been growing and developing, still growing and developing. You guys have to be a part of the masjid. Not just at this time. The youth, the Shabbat, they have something to do with the community. They have something to do with the community. So we want Coventry to be one of those cities where the youth have a lot of activity. You guys are brothers and sisters, organized well enough, doing enough between yourselves where these non-Muslims around us in school, these neighbors, they're hearing about Al-Islam, the correct understanding of Al-Islam. So with that, we ask Allah to give all of you the tawfiq, inshallah, and to protect all of you, to protect your religion, inshallah, and to make you people, those people who will grow up as Muslims proud to be Muslims, and you're Muslims with knowledge and with conviction. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika wa shadu wa la ilaha illa astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayhi. Wassalamu alaykum. Barakallahu alaykum. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he increase in your knowledge and enlighten you. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward you and to put it in your scale of hasana. Uh, uh, we would like to say to the Shaykh, may Allah bless you and may Allah reward you for your time and for your knowledge. And uh, we would like to invite him again, inshallah, in front of everybody uh, at any time close and possible, if Allah wills. And uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He make us of those who listen to the speech and act by it, as this is the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, and the way of the Muslimin. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to benefit from the beautiful reminder and the beautiful points that the Shaykh I mentioned, which are very, very interesting and very, very relevant. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward him for his knowledge and to increase him in knowledge and to make us of those who will benefit from the speech. And also, uh, now we will be having uh, a reminder uh, by Dr. Muhammad Aqib, uh, may Allah reward him, and he will be coming here momentarily, inshallah.